PlayStation 1. The early 3D console that really couldn't do 3D very well, but did it anyway. The console was the birthing ground for a lot of things video game related, and one of them was survival horror. While horror games have their origins in the 80s with pioneering titles like Maze and later Sweet Home, it wasn't until the late 90s with titles like Resident Evil and Silent Hill that the genre really bloomed. In fact, titles like Resident Evil and Silent Hill would prove to be so influential that gameplay elements pioneered with their releases can still be found in modern horror games released today. When two games successfully jumpstart an entire shop genre on their own, there are bound to be imitators, and boy, who was there. The horror genre was popping on the PS1 with around 60 releases, but more interestingly, whole franchises were born and died on this console, and out of the 60 horror games released for the platform, about 30 of those are exclusive to the system. Hello and welcome to Growing Up Gaming, it's that show on YouTube where I, your best boy Randolph, look through the library of gaming and find titles that for one reason or another didn't do too well critically or commercially, and review them and see if they're worth my time and more importantly, your time. Today's episode is gonna be a little different because we're not gonna talk about just one game, but five. But we're also not gonna go super in depth with them like we usually do. I've sat down and I've played the first two hours of all 31 titles that are exclusive to the PS1, and I've selected five that I think are hidden gems, and I'm gonna tell you why they're hidden gems. These aren't gonna be full-size reviews, just my impressions of the games based on the first two hours of gameplay. Sometimes a little more since this is a hidden gems list, and the games are pretty good and fun to play, and sometimes I just couldn't stop myself. Three things to note before we get into it. I'm gonna avoid big name titles like Resident Evil and Silent Hill because this is a hidden gems list. 2. I'm gonna stick to games that are exclusive to the platform, however some of these games are available on PC, but since there are bad incompatibility issues with PC games from this era, I'm choosing to allow games on this list that have also had a PC port, because that PC port might not work for everyone or even anyone at all. 3. This is by no means a top 5 or anything, these are just 5 games that I thought were kind of neat. With that out of the way, let's look at some hidden horror gems that are available exclusively on the PlayStation 1. Sneaking around in the shadows and sniffing for treasure. So a lot of times when people go digging through a console's backlog, it's to find a game that's like that other really good game. And if you're one of those people and you're on the lookout for a Resident Evil game, then this one is for you, because the first game on our list is Data Crisis 2. Released on the 13th of September 1999, Dino Crisis 2 opens as a military force of badasses are sent to investigate why a research lab from the first game, along with a nearby city, has disappeared. Shortly after arriving on the island, the badass camp is overrun by dinosaurs and everyone dies except Regina, who returns from the first game, and this guy. Dylan, you son of a bitch. The two, being the only survivors left on an island full of very dangerous dinosaurs, do the thing that is always the smartest thing to do when you're inside a horror scenario. They split up. Like Resident Evil 2, Dino Crisis 2 tells its story through two narratives. But unlike Resident Evil 2, Dino Crisis 2 switches control back and forth between the main protects occasionally. Instead of something like Claire and Leon's AB scenario where you play the game as one character, then follow in that character's footsteps with another character. Like this first part we play as Dylan and Dylan. makes his way through the jungle, encounters some weird helmet dudes with grenade guns, escapes a T-Rex and gets himself locked in a security room. And then the control switches to Regina, who must now find a way to rescue him. The two characters have different abilities to get past different obstacles. Regina's stun baton can open an electric gate and Dylan's machete can very inefficiently chop its way through vines. It could potentially be confusing, but the game is structured in such a way that one character will make their way through a path and then open a door, and then get trapped or caught up in something, and call for the other character. And then the other character will run through the same area the first character was just in to get to them, and on the way there, unlock various doors that the first character couldn't. Most times these are just secret places that just unlock health kits, but on a few occasions I did unlock a shortcut or a completely new path. The two characters outside of their starting equipment and special abilities don't play that much differently. Dylan has a shotgun that can take out enemies easier but has a slower fire rate, and Regina has a handgun with a quicker fire rate and lower damage. But those differences are nullified about 30 minutes to an hour into the game, when it becomes possible to buy weapon upgrades. See, this game does do some things differently than Resident Evil and Dino Crisis 1. The gameplay this time around is much more action oriented. You still need to pick up keys, health packs, and you still need to mostly dodge enemies, but ammo is no longer a direct resource you can pick up. Instead, killing enemies gives you point, and killing enemies efficiently blocking their attacks and getting past an area without taking damage gets you bonus points. 
And what do I use these points for? Well, instead of ammo pickups, there are terminals around the island that, while also functioning like safe rooms, more interestingly, also function as upgrade facilities. Here you can buy health kits for the points you get from killing monsters, and you can also, if you kill a lot of monsters, buy new weapons, magazine upgrades, and more importantly, replenish your ammunition in exchange for points. When I first played this, I feared that it would be something like in Blue Stinger for the Dreamcast. That game has a similar system, but it's so poorly balanced that one enemy only drops enough currency to buy just enough ammo to take down one more enemy. And the combat doesn't allow you to perform efficient kills to save ammo, so the whole system is just pointless. But Dino Crisis avoid this, and as I was playing, I could definitely tell if I had a good run through the island, as I could rack up for tons of bonus points. And I could definitely tell when I didn't do well and I took lots of damage and required lots of health kits and wasted valuable points replenishing my ammo and health kits. It's a really addicting system and in a game like this where the story starts out weak, it's definitely a saving grace. You'd probably think this arcade feel would ruin the horror aspect, but it really doesn't. Yeah, the player isn't defenseless, but neither is the enemy. They are very fast, they hit very hard and more importantly, their numbers are unlimited. If I had to call it something else than scary, I would call it panicky, because that is what it is. Each trek through the facility is a panic fest. A lot of horror games have panic sections to throw the player off, but Dino Crisis 2 manages to make every section a panic section, and it produces a horror experience that is marginally different from the norm. And it's also a welcome departure, even if the point system does sacrifice some immersion. But come on, this is a game about time travel and dinosaurs, and speaking of time travel and dinosaurs... The plot, while starting out weak and formulaic, does become more interesting as the game progresses. It becomes clear that there's something off about the motorcycle helmet guys. At one point, they run into a dead-end alley, but they are not there when Regina catches up to them. And later on, she captures one of them, but she speaks in an odd way and seems to idealize Dylan! them for some reason. If you're into the Resident Evils, I think this story will be your thing, as there seems to be a lot of mysterious things going on and a lot of conspiracies. And if you're into the Resident Evils in general for the whole package, then this is probably also your thing. And that's why it's the first game on our list, to kick things off in a familiar tone before we deep dive into the weirder sides of PS1 horror. And diving deeper we will with our next pick. Released on the 25th of June 1996, Tecmo's Deception, Invitation to Darkness, stars our titular hero Randolph. The game starts with naming the protagonist and I named him Randolph because I couldn't think of something funny. Anyways, Randolph is apparently the prince of a kingdom and he has just returned from another kingdom where he has successfully courted that kingdom's princess. Upon returning and informing his father of this, his father then declares that Randolph should be the next king. And then he coughs off blood, falls over and then a floating sword kills him. The floating sword is Randolph's sword, and right after the killing happens, Randolph's younger brother bursts in and declares Randolph a traitor, and then the guards arrest Randolph, despite also having witnessed the floating sword do the murdering. Later at the execution, Randolph hears a voice and gets offered a deal with the devil. The devil promises to give Randolph power to take revenge on literally everyone, but that he must go to a mysterious castle and claim the power for himself. And then he does, and that's what the game is about, claiming the power. In the first level, we enter the castle, we find that there are other people here, and then there's a sexy vampire lady who tells us that we need to kill those people. But we can't just kill them like we would in a regular game with weapons or magic. No, we gotta kill them with the power, and that power is the castle. Let me explain. This game is a first-person action game, but it's also a strategy game with some simulator elements. The power we were promised at the beginning of the game is the ability to build upon the castle and place traps around the castle and activate them. And in order to become strong enough to take revenge on our brother, we gotta kill a bunch of people. And finding people is not really a problem, because there are a lot of people that are drawn to this place and come here in search of treasure. Each level has waves of enemies into the castle, and it's up to us, the player, to place traps around the castle and then lure the enemies into those traps. 
There are about 20 different enemy types and each type has different strengths and weaknesses and it's up to us the player to place and lure our targets into the right traps, because there are multiple types of traps to pick from, each with different stats. And on top of that, we the player can build extra rooms in the castle and certain enemy types with certain goals are attracted to a certain room. Like a thief looking for a rare book will go to the den type room. So yeah, a surprising amount of stuff to do in this PS1 game. And when you're in the thick of it, dancing between enemies and trying to lure them into your traps, the game is very, very fun. And the levels aren't too long. I would say that one takes about 20 minutes or so, and they end with a boss fight that can really have you scratching your head. So when you finally lure the boss into that final trap and win, you are very tempted to play another level, which I'm not gonna do for this video because we've got more games to cover, but yeah. That was Tecmo's Deception Invitation to Darkness, a cool little hybrid game that you should check out if this brief overview of the game interested you. is Parasite Eve. Released on the 29th of March 1998, Parasite Eve is probably the most well-known game on this list, and for a while it was a somewhat popular game. And one of the reasons for its popularity is no doubt that it is a Square game released during the absolute height of Square Games popularity. Our story begins as NYPD rookie Aya Brea is attending an opera with some dude. During the opera everyone in attendance catches fire except for Aya and the lead actress on stage. Aya confronts the actress, who states that Aya's mitochondria needs some more time to develop, and then she flees backstage. Aya runs after her, but is quickly confronted by horrible mutated monsters. The combat system in Parasite Eve is a far cry from the Resident Evil games. There are no monsters for Aya to encounter in the overworld of the game, so when combat happens, the screen will fade to grey and transition into a combat stage. Gameplay here can best be described as a real-time tactical RPG. Aya has a meter, and when that meter is full, she can perform actions like using items or an attack. If we hit X, which is the combat button, the game will freeze and will be shown a cone around Aya. This cone is the range of her equipped gun, and it will auto-target the monster closest to Aya. By flicking the analog stick in either direction, we can change her target, and by pressing X again, we will queue up a shot on the selected monster. And depending on how many action points Aya has and what gun she is using, more or less shots can be queued. When all available shots have been queued, we can press the X button again and the game will resume its real-time state, and I will carry out her queued actions. Enemies have heavily telegraphed attack patterns, much like an average MMO, so combat isn't just about hitting the combat button as soon as the meter fills up. As enemies in this game do a lot of damage, and once Aya is performing her queued action, she cannot move until they are carried out. So waiting for an enemy to attack and then dodging the attack before queuing combat actions can be the difference between winning and the game over screen. With the rat monster death, there's another feature in Parasite Eve that becomes present. The random encounters in this game aren't random. Monsters don't attack after Aya has taken a certain amount of steps. Instead, they only attack when Aya is on a certain position on the screen, and monsters will only attack once per screen. When Aya is not killing rat monsters, she is exploring locations in the game, and here, the gameplay is a lot like Resident Evil. In this backstage area, we need to find a way into the room at the end of the corridor, where the actress is hiding. And the way we get into that room is by searching the other rooms for clues, items and maybe some puzzle stuff, like Resident Evil. Like Resident Evil, the levels have supplies like health items and ammo stats throughout them, and the game rewards exploration by also putting one or two pieces of good gears in hidden areas. Since I am a master Resident Evil guy, I quickly found a key that opened the locked room, and then found another key there that opened the room at the end of the hallway. And now, we can go confront the actress. Aya confronts the actress, and she says some more stuff about mitochondria before declaring that she is no longer Melissa, which is apparently her name, and is now Eve. Parasite Eve, I guess. And then she jumps into a sewer. Here, Aya confronts her once again, and she says some more stuff about mitochondria before she spawns an electric alligator boss and turns into a blood cloud and flies away. The alligator boss and bosses in general are like other enemies in the game, except that they have more health, do more damage, and usually have an extra attack pattern and maybe some boss stages. 
Electric Alligator here has two attack patterns, so the thing about positioning Aya before queuing up combat actions comes into play. And during his second stage, the tactical RPG thing comes into play as well, as we the player must quickly figure out his pattern and then adapt to it. With Electric Alligator boss dead, Aya heads out of the Opera House, and her friend Daniel punches a reporter and takes her back to the police station. The police station is not just next story beat in the game, it's also this game's version of an RPG hub. Aya gets her missions here, and there are characters to interact with and little subplots to follow. It is also here that she can buy and sell equipment and upgrade and store equipment that we find around New York. Unlike most of our horror games, we can freely travel to and back from locations that Aya has visited, to pick up items that we left behind or talk to characters that we missed on our first run. We can even travel between locations while on a mission just by walking back to the beginning of the level, which I imagine can become quite useful later on if there's a hard boss fight that Aya can't take down with her current equipment. It might seem like it would miss with the pace of the game's plot, which has a very urgent feel to it, but it really doesn't, and more importantly it saves us from one of the most annoying things about PS1 games. Having to reload a 4 hour old save because we missed one item in one location or forgot to do that one thing. So even if it does mess with the game's pacing, I'm alright with sacrificing a little pace in exchange for not having to repeat 4 hours of gameplay. At the police station, Aya and the rest of the department is informed that Eve is in Central Park, and Aya and Daniel rush there to stop her from killing even more people. Central Park is much like the last level, there's a lock gate. We gotta get past the lock gate to confront Eve, and to do that we gotta find a key, kill some monsters, pick up some items... And I have to say something. I'm not normally a big fan of pre-rendered backgrounds, while I do collect physical copies of games, I mostly play old games on emulators, because emulators allow you to fiddle with the settings and make games prettier than they were when they originally released. And for that reason, I have never really been a big fan of pre-rendered backgrounds. Emulators like EPSXE can smooth polygons and make them prettier, but it cannot do the same for backgrounds images that a game like this relies on. But I must admit that this game's backgrounds are really something. Games with pre-rendered backgrounds often play it safe by having the game set inside a mansion, but Parasite Eve dares to venture outside the mansion and gives us beautiful locations like a snowy central park or this street over here. And it just raises the game above most other pre-rendered games and it totally makes up for the lack of emulation tweaking. And the at times awkward movement and lack of spatial awareness that there unfortunately is in these kinds of games. While at the park I quickly found the key that we need to open the gate and confront Eve because I am the best Resident Evil guy. But as Aya enters the concert hall, Eve turns everyone into a goo and then runs off. Aya chases after her and battles hordes of mutated monsters on the way. And at a fork in the road, she once again confronts Eve, who asks her if she wants to go on a carriage ride, which Aya accepts. And then the horse gets set on fire and Aya battles it out with Eve once again while on the carriage. I know this scene is stupid and nonsensical, but it's also kind of awesome. And as Eve and I battle it out, I think it's time we say goodbye to them for now. If you like what you saw and you think a survival horror RPG might be your cup of tea, then go play the thing I just played, it's good. Now, on to the next one. Warning! Warning! A state of emergency is in effect. Released on the 2nd of August 1996, Overblood is the exact type of game that comes to mind when I think of the PS1 era of video games. It opens with a glorious long-winded FMV sequence and then it just dumps the players into the shoes of its title character, Raz. The very second that we the player take control of Raz, he starts to die, because Raz is just awoken from cryosleep and the room he is in is very cool. So how do we stop from dying? Well, we press a button on one of these panels that has something to do with the maintenance of the room of course, but we need to crouch on this particular panel here to activate the right button, 
Because in Overblood, the difference between crouching and standing when interacting with an object can literally be the difference between life and death. But now that the button is pressed, our situation is kind of fixed. The room is heating up again, but we're still dying a little. So we need to go into this room and once again crouch in front of this box to pick up a sleek looking vest and this chip thing that will probably work on the robot over there. Oh, and while we're here, we also need to crouch and use on this other box, even though it's open and looks empty. Because this clearly empty box has the game saving mechanic inside it, because why not? Now that we have the sleek vest for not dying of cold and the device for saving, Let's go use the microchip on the little robot. Oh, it works, and he is uh, cute as fuck. Now that we have a broken robot, we can actually switch control between Raz and... What's his name? So, what am I supposed to call you? Peepo? Why not? Peepo it is. Alright, Peepo. We can now switch control between Raz and Peepo. Now that we have Peepo, I need to come clean about something. This game, Overblood, is basically the reason I made this video. Because it's the reason I dove into the PS1's library to begin with. I saw a video about this years ago, and then I played it, and it's honestly one of my favorite games of all time. And it's obviously not nostalgia speaking, since I didn't know about this game until a few years ago. I know it's awful on a technical level, and I know it has a lot of bullshit mechanics, but I still love it. So I'm not gonna pretend to have an unbiased opinion about this game, so let me just tell you about some of the awesome things in this game, and some of the really bad things in this game. Basically, the first thing we do with Peepo gives us a pretty good idea of the bullshit that we must deal with in the game. Peepo can access these terminals, I think it's like a Natsu D2 thing, and that's fine what we must deal with behind the door that Peepo opens is not fine. So we go into this room, and it looks like an obvious dead end, right? I mean, we could walk up to the rubble and jump up on this ledge. Well, you would think so, but no. What we actually gotta do is walk over to this corner and pick up this invisible item that will be essential to progress later on in the game. And then we go to the middle of the rubble and press X, even though there's no indicator that we can do this, and pressing X on stuff isn't something that we can generally do. It's just something that we can do sometimes when Overblood feels like it. Then after that, we find an elevator and activate it, and then a zombified corpse falls out of the elevator, and it's kinda weird. The corpse looks a little bit like Raz, it kinda looks like it could be his brother, or maybe a clone. Anyways, we need to restore power to the elevator, but before that, we need to go into the storage room and pick up this invisible knife that will be essential to progressing later on at another point and then we can move on to the immediate objective. There is this gap, and we need to get over to get to the power room, or whatever. But we need something that will help us get across. This is another good example of Overblast bullshit. The only way to know how to get over the gap is to die. That sounds weird, right? Well, it is, but here it goes. There is this statue in this room, and it floats. When you interact with it while standing, it will bring up some text about how it's floating. But if we crouch and interact with it, the game will give us an anti-gravity chip and then immediately kill us. So the only way to get the solution to the problem is by forced trial and error. I mean, unless you just happen to press the interact button while standing right after having just interacted with the object while standing. Because that will make Raz push over the statue so he can crouch down and get the chip. Normally this is the type of shit that will make me throw my controller. But when playing Overblood, I just find it a bit funny. I like Overblood, and I don't know why. It's very flawed, and I can't figure out whether or not I would have liked it if I didn't know all its quirks. Like the different interactions with crouching slash standing, and knowing where the safe thing is, and remembering to use it all the time. Oh, and the thing where X is a quick time button sometimes, but mostly not. Oh, and also the thing about how you can walk over some ledges to your death, and other times you can't. I know that one doesn't seem like a big deal, because surely you can just not walk over any ledges at all, right? Well, no. Certain ledges require you to walk to the very edge of them to perform an action or pick up an invisible item. And there's no way to know how far is too far until you've plummeted to your death at least once. But I still love it. Playing it makes me happy, and it's not just the voice acting or the very, very, very rough FMV sequences or the convoluted idiot plot. It's that too, but it's also the level design, the combat, the puzzles, it's all of it. I love all of it, I love Overblood, and honestly, if this seems like something you would at least consider just a little bit to try out, 
do yourself a favor and do it. It's fun if you're into these kinds of games. Alright, that's enough about Overblood. Let's look at our last game. Last in our list of hidden gems is Kudelka, and the game opens as our titular heroine is drawn to a mysterious monastery. While trying to find a way into the monastery, Kudelka hears the signs of a struggle, and she breaks through a window to find a man badly injured and under attack from a nightmare creature. Kudelka fends off the nightmare creature, and then she forms an uneasy alliance with the man that she's thus saved. And together they set out on a quest to find the source of the monsters, and more importantly, find a way out of the mansion. If you're comfortable with early Resident Evil's level design, then you're gonna be right at home in this game. The monastery is the entire game. As we go through, we're gonna pick up things that unlock other things, allowing us to access more and more of the mansion. And at certain points in the mansion, there are bolted doors that we can unbolt from the inside, allowing us to easily backtrack or fun track to certain sections of the monastery. As our heroes enter the monastery servant quarters, they encounter the groundskeepers, who inform them that the monastery was converted into a mansion some time ago and that it was the home to a prominent family up until recently. The groundskeepers offer our two protagonists food, and while Edward accepts, Kodelka does not, as she suspects that the food has been poisoned. A suspicion that later proves true when Edward becomes violently ill, to the point that Kodelka must use her magic powers to cure him. In their search to confront the groundskeepers, our two survivors come across a Catholic priest, James, and they save him from a monster. While James doesn't believe the story about the groundskeepers trying to kill our heroes, he does team up with our protagonist to find out what happened to the mansion. Up until now I've held off on explaining the game's combat system, because you can't really get a feel of it until you have the entire party assembled. But since James has now joined, we can talk about it. If Parasite Eve is Final Fantasy VII trying to be Resident Evil, then Kodelka is Final Fantasy VII trying to be Silent Hill, and it works. It has the RPG elements of Final Fantasy, your characters have stats and they level up, and through these level ups you can build them however you want by spending points in their various attributes. The higher the skill is in an attribute, the stronger the affected ability will be. Like Makadelka has a lot of points in intelligence and mind, so her spells are strong. Combat happens when our party is traversing the mansion, at random points the party will be attacked, and the game will transition into a battle screen. On the battle screen, the game becomes a turn-based RPG, and you can move your party around the board and perform various actions. Each monster has an element and various strengths and weaknesses, and it's up to you to find and exploit these weaknesses to take them down. The Silent Hill thing comes into play through the game's monster design. The monsters are absolutely terrifying, and while other RPGs often suffer from having basically the same roster of enemies, Kodelka does not. You got your three-headed upside-down gunman, this weird crystal thing, this stone man, these haunted chairs, this rat that looks like a skinny woman in a rat suit more than does a big rat, and scariest of them all, the demon baby. Demon babies are scary enough on their own, but how do we make a demon baby even scarier? Well, you give it the lower body of a spider, of course. And how do you make a demon baby that has the lower body of a spider even scarier? You change all its spider legs to more baby legs, and then you have this thing, and it will definitely haunt your dreams. But the Silent Hill inspiration isn't limited to just the monster designs, but also how the monsters are framed and how you fight them. You're never gonna go up against hordes of enemies as an example, and you never really feel like you can easily win a fight. Every fight is intimate and personal, and it feels like one wrong step can be the end of your party. And at later points in the game, that is not far off. And then there's this whole fighting thing. Like other survival horror games, items are scarce and very valuable, and when you have to worry about ammo and medkits when you're fighting enemies that can actually put up quite a good fight, then that just raises the tension level. Speaking of tension level, deeper inside the mansion, a human intruder attempts to kill our protagonist, but they fight him off and question him. The thief, Elias, claims that the groundskeepers tried to kill him, and that they have killed others who trespassed on the grounds. After Edward executes Elias, the party discovers the room where Elias had hidden his loot, and here, 
Kodelka receives a vision and learns that prior to the mansion being a monastery, it was a prison, and that something has awoken the spirits. Their search for the source of the spirit's unrest lead them to the tomb of an ancient monk. However, the monk, Roger Bacon, is far from dead. And he reveals that he escaped death by performing a ritual from the emigre document. A document that the current owner of the mansion, Patrick, is now in possession of. A document that he wishes to use for something. Upon this discovery, James comes clean and reveals that his purpose for coming to the mansion was to recover the document on behalf of the Vatican because Patrick stole the document from their library. Later on, a gargoyle attacks the party and Kodelka becomes separated from Edward and James. As she tries to find her way back to her party members, she is kidnapped by Ogden, one of the groundskeepers. As Ogden is about to kill Kodelka, his wife Bessie shoots him. She tells Kodelka that the lady of the house, Elaine, was killed by a thief who broke into the mansion, and since then, the couple have lured and killed countless trespassers to avenge Elaine, and Bessie fears that this is what has upset the spirits. As she concludes her story, she turns the gun on herself and pulls the trigger. As much as Kodelka is a game about uncovering the mysteries of a secluded mansion, it is also very much a game about three very broken people who are forced to rely and trust in each other if they want to see their next sunrise. And it's during scenes like these where the protagonists are completely helpless that I'm reminded of Silent Hill again. In a good way, of course. The story of this game is rough and there's some really mature subject matter here and through the game's cinematics, we can see that it is taking a toll on our protagonists. At this point in the game, Kodelka is no longer able to keep up her no-fucks-given attitude. She is visibly distraught when horrible things happen at this point. And Edward is different. Ever since he murdered that thief Elias in rage, he's changed. He's no longer the fun-loving adventurer that we originally encountered in the stables. He's much more serious, and that's neat. In a way, a plot about a horrible murder mansion that fucks with people's sanity can be neat, of course. Finally, there's James. He's questioning his faith and he has come to terms with the fact that there are monsters present in this mansion that defy his view of the world and defy the holy text that he lives his life by. And you can tell through his voice actor that the character is questioning the fundamentals that he has lived his life by up until this point. None of the characters at this point are the same people that we originally met at the beginning of the game. They have changed, they have evolved. They seem to have an actual narrative arc that has to play a feeling for the characters and hoping that nothing bad will happen to them. And that's impressive as fuck when you consider that this game was made by a small studio in 1999 for the PlayStation 1. It's actually such an impressive feat that the only other game I can think of that makes you give similar fuck about the protagonists is Deadly Premonition. And that game released more than a decade after this one. Kodelka realizes that the spirits are not back because of the murders that the groundskeepers committed, but because Patrick is attempting to resurrect his wife with the emigre document. She makes her way back to her party, and together they race to stop Patrick from performing the resurrection. And that's all I'm gonna tell you about Kodelka's plot. Originally I was only gonna play two hours of each game on this list, just enough to get a basic outline of the plot and a feel for the gameplay, but Two hours into Kodelka wasn't enough, and I needed to know where the story was going, and oh man, it did not disappoint. It starts out a bit slow, and the first hour or two is relatively uneventful, aside from the encounter with the groundskeepers. But after that, it starts picking up, and each scene that has the party interacting with each other or an outside force reveals just enough of the plot that you want more, but not enough so that you get the full picture of what is going on, and that wondering just leaves you wanting more and more and more. And before you know it, you're 13 hours into the game and the credits are rolling. So that was Kodelka, and if a Silent Hill inspired Final Fantasy VII game seems like your thing, then this one is for you. So go play the thing I just played if it sounds awesome, because it's good. So that was 5 horror gems exclusive to the PS1. I originally wanted to make a list of 5 gems like Resident Evil, but digging into the PS1's library, I found that while there are a lot of games like Resident Evil, there aren't a lot of good ones, so I ended up going in the direction of finding games that offer a different experience instead. I think this list overall gives a good idea of what the PS1's library has to offer. Once you get past the more famous titles, there are a lot of hidden gems here that can offer a refreshing take on the Agents Lab horror formula. So I hope with this list you found a game or two that you like and maybe want to try out. But be warned if you're a collector, because these games are not cheap. The cheapest PAL Dino Crisis 2 I've found is 40 euro and the NCSC version is 35 US dollars. I couldn't find a PAL version of Tecmo's Deception or Parasite Eve, 
but the cheapest NTSC version of Techno's Deception is 30 US dollars, and the cheapest NTSC version of Parasite Eve is 35 US dollars. The cheapest PAL overblock copy I found is 8 euro, and the NTSC version is 45 US dollars. Finally, there's Kodelka, the PAL version is 20 euro, and the NTSC version is 100 dollars. Honestly, except for the PAL versions of Roblox and Godelka, none of these games are really worth the asking price. Especially if you haven't gotten around to playing the games that these games were inspired by. Like Resident Evil Silent Hill and Final Fantasy, since those games can sometimes be found for much, much cheaper. Don't get me wrong, this is a list of 5 really good games for the PS1, but they're just not worth the eBay price. And I think that's all I have to say about these games. Go play the things I just played if you can find them for cheap. They're good games, they're just not... $40 good games. Until next time, bye bye!